So the topic I was asked to speak about was can we prevent concussions? Um, I think is yes, we can prevent a number of them. Perhaps reduce the risk is, is a way to say it. I just want to review some things. I, I hope there'll be a review for most of you. Concussion, of course, most people in this room will know, is a functional problem, not a structural injury, right? The brain is not bruised, the cells aren't dying, it's not swollen. Um, it's a problem with function, really electrical connectivity at the level of the axons. Um, number two, it's caused by a rapid rotational acceleration of the head or spinning of the brain. And so if you're going to try and prevent it, that's where you have to focus your efforts. And lastly, again, I, I suspect this is review for most of you, but the way a normal neuron works is by conducting an action potential, right? Movements of sodium and potassium rapidly across the axonal membrane. When a concussion happens, you get a massive disorganized influx of sodium into the neurons randomly throughout the brain, not neurons that are intended to fire an action potential, but just any neuron exposed to a sheer strain. And you have to pump the sodium back out of the cell, a process which requires ATP, okay? I just wanted to review that because that will come up as we, as we go forward. Um, this is my illustration of an axon, okay? <laughs> It's horrible, but all I'm trying to show you is sodium's on the outside, one by one in nice orderly fashion that goes into the cell until you get to the end and you spit out some sort of chemical that triggers the next neuron or the muscle cell to do something, all right? That's the way it normally should work. So um, there have been multiple methods proposed for ways of reducing concussion, preventing concussions. Education and legislation gets talked about all the time. To me, that's an excellent preventative strategy for preventing sequelae from concussion, right? So um, if athletes, coaches, parents, doctors, athletic trainers, everybody is more able to recognize concussions, you're more likely to diagnose them and therefore remove athletes from risk and prevent the sequelae, the cumulative effects, the prolonged recoveries and second impact syndrome. But I really was asked to speak about can you prevent some concussions from in the first place and to me, um, that while important, that's not a good way to do it, right? The concussions happen by the time that stuff kicks in. Personal equipment gets talked about all the times, and, and this is actually a major misconception, so I just want to spend some time on it. Helmets don't reduce your risk of concussion. And actually, um, I find the, the, the hardest people to explain this to are sometimes the smartest, right? Guys who are PhDs in, in biology or something that have a hard time getting this. So I'm going to go through it in a little bit of detail. Um, concussion is caused by rapid spinning of the brain after impact. It's not the impact itself, right? If you were going to um, impact the brain tissue, you would have to deform the helmet, hit the skull, deform the skull, and then impact the brain tissue. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen, right? So um, what happens is they get hit in the head and their head spins. Same thing with the helmet. In fact, if you strike an athlete in the mouth guard, which is now an inch or so further away from their center of gravity, you spin the head even faster. And so the, the risk of concussion for strikes to a mouth guard is quite high. Now, it is true that the inside of the helmet is typically um, covered with foam uh, or air cells, depending on which model of helmet you have. And so at the time of impact, that foam will collapse, those air cells will compress and decrease the force by the time it hits your head. Yeah, true, slightly. And if this is the threshold of force that's required to spin the head enough to give an athlete a concussion, most concussions in sports occur at a level up here. And so if you decrease that force a slight amount, you really have no significant impact on the overall rate of concussions because you're still up here. Now there are a handful, probably, this is assuming, that occur at this level and you decrease the force a little and maybe you prevent those, but not enough that it has any impact on the rates of concussion that we can measure. Furthermore, people change in response to equipment, right? And this is going to be a recurrent theme uh, during my talk. There are unintended consequences of everything you do. So during my lifetime, there were no helmets in the NHL, right? When I was a kid, people didn't wear helmets. Okay. Then they became mandatory, right? And within three years of helmets becoming mandatory in ice hockey, the rates of high-sticking penalties tripled. All of a sudden, they had to invent a penalty called boarding, where they had to specifically say, you're not allowed to take a guy who's like four feet out and throw him headfirst into the boards, right? Nobody did that before there were helmets, because you might hurt him, right? You know, the guy's going to go headfirst into the boards. But once he has a helmet on, you feel like he's protected, and you are more aggressive, and the aggression of the game goes up. And so, quite honestly, when you introduce helmets to a sport, the rates of concussion are more likely to go up than go down. 
Now, there's a reason for it, right? In American football, in men's ice hockey, there were catastrophic brain injuries occurring. Guys were fracturing their skull, impinging on the brain, giving hematomas, and dying. So helmets do an excellent job of preventing those, right? So everybody should wear a helmet with a chin strap around the chin, right? A mouth guard in the mouth because you will prevent other injuries. But the price you pay for that actually is that, that you're likely to increase the number of concussions. And the reason I want to emphasize this is there is a movement now to introduce helmets into girls lacrosse. Um, I would be totally against that. There has never been in the medical literature a case report that I can find of catastrophic brain injury occurring in girls lacrosse. You would introduce helmets to prevent something that is not happening anyway, and the price you would pay for that is that the number of concussions would more likely go up than go down. Now, um, people have said to me, well, men, you know, boys' sports play, get more aggressive when you introduce equipment because boys are aggressive by nature, but that won't happen in girls lacrosse. And quite honestly, that, that might be true, but I think you've just never seen a girls lacrosse match. I mean, I think they are every bit as, as aggressive. I had John Corrado have me cover field hockey at Northeastern one time. I was a fellow. I thought this, this is going to be great. You know, college girls are running around, the skirt's on, it's sunny outside, it's going to be wonderful. It's not. It's like the most violent thing I've ever seen. There's big clubs, they're swinging them in the air, there's hard balls flying through, one girl cut her forehead open. I mean, it's not, I think they're just as aggressive. So, so I would be against that. Um, mouth guards, similar situation with mouth guards. So the original study for mouth guards, um, th there was um, two studies in the Journal of Dental Traumatology, and people reference these all the time, right? The, the mouth guards will reduce your risk of concussion. But if you go back and pull those original two articles that everybody cites, um, they were on cadavers, right? So A, concussion is a functional problem, and so it's hard to diagnose it in a cadaver. Uh, B, they, 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 this is true, they, they had two guys, and, and one they put a mouth guard in, and one they didn't, and they hit them in the cranium with the shell edge hammer, and then they recorded the amount of data. And the guy with the mouth guard in his mouth had less recordable damage than the other guy. Right? So it's got nothing to do with concussions at all. Um, now, I do think, same as a helmet, if you hit someone directly on the chin and they have a mouth guard in, it will decrease the force a little bit more before it gets to the head. Of course, if you hit them anywhere else, then that's not applicable. And the same thing with the helmets. If it reduces the force a little bit, blows up here at this level of force, if this is the concussion threat hold, the mouth, mouth guard does nothing. Right? There might be a handful here but they're not significant. Now again, mouth guards will decrease your risk of facial bone fractures and dental trauma and the things for which they were intended, and so people should wear them. That's not what I'm saying. But for concussion, it's not, it's not a great way to try and prevent concussions. Um, collision anticipation. So Jason Mihalik, who is a PhD and a colleague uh, and a really great guy, did a study in ice hockey, pediatric boys ice hockey, uh, bantam level. And he measured what was called collision anticipation. They videotaped all these games. And they looked at every time one of the ice hockey players got a concussion. And they had this checklist that they used as criteria for determining, did the athlete uh, anticipate the concussion? Okay? So when athletes, A, were looking at the direction from which the collision was going to happen and had time to flex at the hip, flex at the knees, and drive their shoulders through the collision the rates of concussion were low. If they were looking in the direction the collision was coming but didn't have time to brace and drive through it but just sort of saw it, the concussion rates were higher. And if they didn't see the hit coming at all, the concussion rates were the highest, right? So anticipating the collision will decrease your risk of concussion. And the reason it's important for people in these room is if you watch ice hockey at all levels, it's not just kids, but it happens more often in the younger kids, when they go into the corner for a puck, they go for the puck, right? They, they don't stop. They don't look around to see what's coming. They just go for the puck. And so they get the puck. They turn around and bam, they get hit. And that's how they get a concussion. As the level of play increases, they look one time. So now they catch the puck. And as they're catching the puck, they hit the guy who's coming in to hit them, which quite frankly, I think is a good way to play, right? Hockey is an aggressive game. And you are safer if you play it aggressively. So I tell athletes, when that situation, if there's going to be a collision, initiate it, right? Don't sit there and wait for it. Initiate it. <laughs> Both guys are initiating it. I think it's safer. Um, finally, conditioning. So Dawn Comstock, who is an epidemiologist, I mentioned her this morning. We collaborate a lot. Um, she has this great cohort of athletes, 200 high schools throughout the country, all the athletes in every sport, boys and girls. And she measured their neck strength 
a few years in a row, only one year of data is out yet, but she measured their neck strength and their circumference and their head circumference and a bunch of other things. Um, but what she showed, two things, so the, the, there's been an abstract, this is preliminary data, but um, first she separated people's neck strength into percentiles, right? Zero to 25th percentile is the quarter of athletes with the weakest neck strength, 75th to 100th is the strongest neck strength. And those who had the stronger necks had a lower incidence of concussion than those with the weaker necks. And actually, on secondary analyses, for every one pound of resistance, your neck strength increased. The risk of sustaining a concussion decreased by about 5%. So I do think that strengthening the neck muscles will decrease your rate of concussion. And if you think about it, if concussion is due to a rapid rotation of the brain after injury, the stronger your neck muscles are, the more rigidly they attach your head to the rest of your body, the lower the risk of concussion, right? The force is going to translate into the mass of your head times the acceleration. The acceleration is what causes the injury. So if you could increase the mass of your head, it would accelerate at a slower rate, right? Now, you can't do that. But if you rigidly attach it to the rest of your body, it goes from the mass of your head, which might be 8 pounds or so, to, you know, 220 pounds in my case. And so it accelerates at a much slower rate and your, your risk goes down. That's the theory behind it anyway. Dawn's study is the first one I know of that, that shows some preliminary evidence that that might work. Now, what nobody has shown is that if you take people with weaker neck muscles and you work them out and their neck muscles get stronger, that their risk goes down, right? Nobody's shown that yet. Um, but still, it's hard to imagine the harm of strengthening neck muscles. I think there's a lot of good reasons to do it, and so we encourage that in our athletes. Uh, rule changes are clearly going to be an effective way, except that there is unintended consequences of everything we do, right? So there is a push now to decrease the age at which we introduce collision to sports, right? Uh, don't play football until you're 15. Don't introduce checking into ice hockey until you're 15, right? Um, I understand the hypothesis of it. I don't think it's a good idea for a couple of reasons. Number one, Carolyn Emery did a study in Canada. So it turns out that in Alberta, the province of Canada, they introduced checking at the peewee level, okay, lower, lower age group. In Quebec, they introduced it at the Bantam age group, higher age group, okay. In the peewee, so now you're just looking at the lower aged athletes, right, in the peewee athletes, the leagues that have body checking have higher rates of concussion than the leagues that don't. Okay, and I, I think we all knew that, right? It was important to show it, but I think intuitively you would have guessed that, right? The follow-up. Now, you look at the next year and you compare bantam to bantam. The rates of concussion are higher in Quebec, where the checking got introduced at a later age, right? Now, in her study, it was not statistically significant, so I don't want you to accuse me of exaggerating. But the rates of all injuries was higher when checking was introduced later, and I suspect, had there been more concussions in the sample, that that, that, that would have been statistically significant. Um, so I think it's far preferable to introduce collisions, football uh, collisions, tackling, etc., at a younger age, but maybe in a controlled setting, right? So what USA Ice Hockey has done is said, okay, we'll delay checking in competition until a later age, but we're going to initiate training at a younger age, off ice, on ice, in a controlled setting. Here's how to avoid a collision. Here's how to absorb a collision without rattling your head or falling headfirst onto the ice, etc. I think that's a far safer way to do it. If you don't introduce football, you don't let kids play till they're 15, right? So now they're growing up. They're not playing football at all. Now they're 15, right, which is freshman in high school for a lot of these guys, sophomore even for some, right? They're playing against other high schoolers, right? So some of these seniors are 240 pounds, and they're fast and strong and coordinated, and now you got a kid who's 15, and he's going up against them in practice or a game. That's a dangerous situation to me. That's more likely to cause more harm than help. So I think you need to learn how to absorb a tackle, how to deliver a tackle, how to get out of the way of a tackle at a younger age. Perhaps maybe we control the setting. Um, the same thing comes up for heading in soccer. Don't introduce heading until 15. Again, I would be against that because some soccer players could kick the ball pretty hard at that age, right? They're direct, coordinated, and that ball's coming fast. And really, the first time you want to like, learn how to head it in that situation, I don't think so. I think it would be preferable maybe to get them to do it with a Nerf ball. Now it's a their younger age, right? They're in the backyard. Somebody's throwing it to them. They learn how to line up their body, how to push through the ball and deliver the blow to the ball rather than kind of waiting for it to bounce off the head, right? <laughs> now, at a younger age, I think it might be dangerous with a real soccer ball, especially if, you know, it's raining outside and it's, the ball's getting waterlogged like the old balls used to. 
Um, so, but I, I wouldn't just do nothing and now all of a sudden you're 15 and you're going to start doing this stuff. Um, lastly is enforcement, and then I'll, I'll probably stop just to stay on time. Um, there have been several studies about enforcing rules, changing rules, etc., in sports that have shown decrease in injuries. None as of yet with concussion. Um, but one study in particular, I don't have it here, but by Bill Roberts, who's sort of famous in the field of sports medicine, there was something called fair play rules in ice hockey, where they took teams and they gave them sportsmanship points. So when your team is getting ranked, in addition to wins and losses and goals and assists and everything else, they looked at your total number of penalty minutes on your team. And they set a threshold of normal amount of penalty minutes. And if you were in that threshold, nothing happened. You just use your wins and losses and other criteria to, to sort of move you up and down in the ranks. If you were below that total number of penalty minutes, they gave you sportsmanship points. And so added to the points that would count to your ranking, you got sportsmanship points and you could move up the rankings. And if you were above that threshold, they subtracted points from your total. And it turned out that the incidence rate ratio, the injury, the rate at which injuries were occurring was much lower after they introduced the fair play rules where you got points to move up than previously. And it was like 1 to 4, 1.2 to 4.38, right? So substantially lower. So I do think there's an opportunity for rule changes and rule enforcement. And if we were going to focus on preventing concussions, I would shy away from personal equipment and focus on rules and focus on training and focus on strength and conditioning. Thanks.